This session is called Starting and Running Your Business Like a Pro, and it's an opportunity to look at um, different strategies for your business. Um, it's my pleasure we have two great speakers. We have Willie Tolbert, who's been a business solution provider for many years, um, very professional, very patient, very knowledgeable, so you get to learn a little bit from him. And then we also have Jay Savlich. I always mess up your last name. You did perfect. Sav okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I never, you, the, the, you never correct the speaker, you just go with it. Okay, so, uh, you know, you must have read Dale Carnegie. <laughs> but, um, so, he's with Rising Tide Capital Managing Director and really leads a great team of people who work well with small businesses and help to prepare them for success. Um, in addition, he's a restaurateur and has significant expertise in that for many years. Um, and he could be the guy on Bar Rescue um, or one of those shows because he's, he's so knowledgeable and he's tough. <laughs> so um, just to get an idea, how many of you guys are already in business? Everyone already? Okay. So nobody needs to learn about starting a business. So we're going to be talking about running your business like a pro. and. Um, you know, we'll um, let Willie and Jay sort of introduce themselves, give you some more insights, um, and share a little bit about what you think would be helpful, and then really open up to Q&A. This is a panel where you can actually talk and, um, you know, find out some things that you'd like to know from some very knowledgeable people in different areas. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, Willie Tolbert, uh, business solution provider for uh, Legal Shield, and being a business owner and entrepreneur for more than thirty years. I know I only look like I'm twenty-seven. Thank you, uh, <laughs> but um, I've um, been blessed to. It was so amazing. I grew up in a home with my father being an entrepreneur, but he never called it that. He just said that I have my own business and I'm just doing whatever. He was a plumber, he was an electrician, not trained in those areas, but it's just, you know, he came from that stock where you learn it as you go, you watch the first time and you got it the next time. And um, I guess the entrepreneur genes just, you know, was inside already and just needed to get exposure and be developed. And what I appreciate about being in business for myself is I determine uh, my own time. I had someone one ask, once asked, it says, uh, you still doing that thing, whatever that thing was? I said, um, well, if i on the same page with you, I said, let me express to you the difference between what you do and what I do. I said, when you go to work, you have to prove your worth. When I go to work, I determine my worth. Well, I gotta take it from there, huh? <laughs> you probably wonder why we're playing with this microphone, but you're not hearing anything, right? Because <laughs> we, it makes us look like we know what we're talking about. We hold a microphone. All of a sudden, you get real smart. Now there's a there's a camera there, so I was like, what do I need this for? But anyway, um, hi, I'm uh, Jay Savrilich. I um, I was one of the original members, starting team of Rising Tide Capital. Uh, you may have heard of the organization. It's a uh, nonprofit organization that's been working in northern New Jersey for about 14 years. Uh, a number of the individuals in this room have had some experience working with us. Um, some of you in this room may have some future experience working with us, but Rising Tide uh, was started uh, uh, with the identification of a need that there was uh, a lack of uh, services to support uh, starting and growing businesses in New Jersey. Um, my background is uh, in uh, small business of a number of sorts. I spent many, over 30, 30, 40 years starting restaurants in New York City. Um, and you would think I probably, you know, uh, went to Johnson and Wales and got an MBA and no. Can anyone guess what I majored in college in order to become a successful restaurant owner? 
Come on. Arts and sciences. Well, no. <laughs> One more guess. Basket weaving. Basket weaving. Close. <laughs> I got a degree in filmmaking. Wow. Yeah. So uh, uh, the reality, though, the reality of anybody who's in the media, in the media, in the media, you all, many uh, jobs for start for people coming out of school and uh, were then and still continue to be setting up your own companies. If you're doing uh, media productions, independent filmmaking, it's all about running your own businesses. So um, I did get a start in that area and then tumbled <laughs> into the restaurant business. Um, I was, uh, you know, people say luck. I was thinking about this, this whole I was lucky. Well, I don't know luck. You know, luck is, you know, does anyone know what the real definition of luck is? But how do you earn luck? By, by striving and going hard at it. Okay. Preparation, being prepared for an opportunity. There you go. That's exactly right. So luck is actually doing the work in advance of finding the opportunity. So some entrepreneurs will find an opportunity and then do the work, right? Which is sort of that accidental entrepreneurship, right? So we have a 12-week small business training program called the Community Business Academy we do twice a year. Shameless plug. Um, and we'll get people who started their business and they're like, oh, I've got this idea and I want to sell it. And some people want to buy it. But I actually don't know how to run a business yet. And so the Community Business Academy is a program uh, to help teach people how to set up and operate a business that can make money. And so I brought my experience of uh, accidentally getting into the restaurant business accidentally selling tacos and accidentally making money and I do mean that really because I didn't know anything about a restaurant sort of the business but I did have partners who knew more than I did and what what became obvious to me was a couple of things and so for all of you out there who are at whatever stage you're at in your business there's a couple of things that I realized looking back now one is that it really you really do have to have something that people really want who or really need, okay? And we talk about that in the class. It sounds real theoretical, but you know, some entrepreneurs will go out there and go, "This is so. I think this is the best thing I've ever seen. I'm so excited about this. I'm so passionate. I'm just going to go out and by sheer dint of my will, I'm going to convince everybody else to buy it." Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work out so well because some people may be convinced, but you need a lot of people to be convinced. And so some of you guys and gals may be in business now where you've tapped out the market of excited travelers, friends, family, and those people who are related in one way to you. And now you're like, now what am I going to do? You sort of hit this plateau. So we, we have now over 2,000 uh, graduates of the Community Business Academy, and some of them have been out you know, six, eight years, five years. And so we're now working with those individuals to try to expand into um, much larger markets, the markets where they don't know anybody, and sort of bringing that value position, uh, proposition out to a, a, a group of individuals who don't know you at all. And the question is, how do you really do that? And so actually we're working with Casey and a number of other professionals to sort of bring that skills to the marketplace. But I'm going to turn it back over to you for a second, because I could talk forever. Well, actually, I just appreciate what you're stating, because it was stated earlier by Stan when he mentioned like small businesses are really the economic engine of the country. And when you, when you look at it, I was just thinking, um, you need to applaud yourself because you're part of a, a breed, if I can use that word, that um, you have to know this is your calling. Because uh, what is it that you do that differentiates yourself from someone else. Um, there's a lot of people that may can do hair. There's a lot of people that may even be in the restaurant business. What, what makes them come to you? In other words, is that you're on the elevator, you got 30 seconds to tell that CEO, that investor, this is who I am, this is what I do. And what is it that they can walk away with thinking about what you shared with them during that time? And then the other point is, I thought about a, a, a phrase that Jim Rohn states where some people make mistakes in the beginning. It's a, I would say, a novice mistake wherein I want to do this business, I have this business idea, and they jump all the way in without having a plan. And, and they, it's because they want to impress people. And let me tell you, you have to take ego 
out the equation when you're starting the business because you're going to come in contact with rejection. You're going to come in contact with challenges that sometimes may not have even been taught in this classroom. And so Jim Rohn states, he says, you work your full time while you build your fortune part time. And when your fortune part time match your full time, then you explore your next set of options. In other words, how do I move with the business ideas and stated regardless to where you are in the stage of your business, how do I move from operating out of the trunk of my car with my hobby versus having a legitimate business that I can say this is something that I worked hard to get and own. And another point too, and I'll pass the mic on, is money cannot be the motivator for being in business. It has to, you need a mission. What is that mission? Because it's stated that long after the emotion of what you started out to do has lifted, can you still continue on with your goal and your dream of building your business? So I'm just going to think a little bit about that, you know, money not being a motor. How many people in this room are in business uh, to make money? Well, well, yeah. So would you call that a pain point for your business? The ability to successfully generate a profit every month? Yeah. How many, how many people in this room feel like they've passed the break-even point and they're generating enough money, enough money, enough money? I'm going to use that word, enough. <laughs> right. Well, that's an interesting thing, right? So this gets back to this whole question of what is the value of your business to your personal and professional journey, right? Putting the business in the perspective of those things is a really important choice that you guys have to make. Um, some people will do a uh, small business part-time and keep a full-time job. Other people will do that for a while and then segue into full-time entrepreneurship. Other people will have more than one business going on at the same time. And they will be different in, in different industries. And then someone like myself, I went from one restaurant to eight restaurants, and you ask how that happened, it's because I always did it with collaborators, okay? So your choices will determine to a great deal the, the level of your success. So I think it would probably be a good thing to think through a little bit about, you know, they say, what is your one year, your three year, and your five year plan? I mean, the practical reality is how much income does this business need to generate for me one year, three years, and five years? Because that will affect greatly the amount of effort you put into, the amount of scale you build into it, the amount of risk you build into it. You know, we talk about at Rising Tide that there's a couple of things that all businesses need, and one of them is money, right? Another is customers, and the third one I'm going to add to it is time. Okay, there's only so much time in the day. So knowing where your money's going to come from and knowing where your customers are coming from and knowing how much time you have available is sort of this matrix. Is It's the point at which most conflict comes up when it comes to making choices about your business. How many people in the room are doing it full time? And how many people are doing it part time? All right. So with the part time people, you've got other things going on. To support that, right? So in, in both situations, there's going to be different pain points and conflict points. And a lot of that was going to have to do with how ambitious you are, how fast you can move, and ultimately how many customers are available to you. Also, the, the follow-up with that, it's important to take this type of time to invest into your business. Your being here on a Saturday morning after Thanksgiving, you know, it's a true commitment to you that you have for your business. And again, I applaud you because in these type settings, you meet persons who may not have nothing directly to do with your business, but you never know who they know that connect your business. In other words, one of the points I put, um, how do you manage without having expert advice 
in the areas of your business. In other words, if you again do hair, if you run a restaurant, if you run a barbershop or a lawnscaping business, how do you expand upon that? You know, what do I need to know? So by having experts that vary, maybe a CPA, an attorney, uh, a marketing person, you know, having those type of persons around you mm -hmm. can help build your business and also build your confidence. Again, taking e ego out the equation is realizing how important the value that those persons bring to your particular business and realizing they may not say yes to you all the time. You know, that's just a part of the equation. You know, no one in true leadership wants yes people. They want people that are competent in the areas that they specialize in to be able to enhance and bring value to their business. Um, how is cash flow affecting your business? Can a small business operate like a, a large business without the cost? In other words, what resources are available to you as a small business owner that may not be available to the large business owner, that Fortune 500 company? They don't get, I know now with the new tax laws that's on ready for the button to be pressed, it, it's only gonna benefit a certain amount of persons, but how do you take advantage of laws that may not be created for your advantage? How do you work around that? How do you um, optimize still what you do and don't let it become the thermometer of determining your success in your business, uh, finance, tax, um, insurance, what type of insurance do you need for your particular business? Yeah, you know, most people know about life insurance or whatever, but do you have a succession plan? Do you have liability insurance? Yes, you, your cookies are the best since sliced bread, but what if someone is, is short of money and need money and create a fictitious type of situation and say that they broke a tooth off your cookie or they went to the hospital behind your cookie? What do you have in place to make certain that your small business that you work hard for does not collapse because of one neglect? Mm -hmm. We just talk about risk. <laughs> How many people in the room are working on their business by themselves? Solo, solo entrepreneurs. Everybody, right? Everybody, right? So I just wanted to ask you guys, what, um, why by yourself? Why are you just doing it by yourself? Anybody want to answer? Mm -hmm. um, finance. Financial. Yeah. Okay. Right. Your resources are limited, so it, it's, it can only support yourself. All right. Could your business be bigger? Could, would you have more customers than you can handle right now? Not yet. Okay. Anyone else? Reasons why you're working by yourself. Yeah. Just for a minute. Um, just being my first venture, um, I like the simplicity of it, and uh, I often think of it as a way to um, learn the ins and outs of business at a low risk threshold um, that I can take with me into mm -hmm. future endeavors, uh, but also on a personal level, uh, it's funny, I kind of fell into entrepreneurship um, because I was um, employed in my former profession mm -hmm. and kind of discovered Rising Tide um, by accident almost. And uh, so it's almost like part of my entrepreneurship is to make up the fact that I didn't go to school for graphic design, web design, and I'm self-taught. So um, it was more natural to kind of just, um, kind of just go into the solo mm -hmm. preneur route. It's really like an alternative to just like getting a design job per se. I think it's I think it's uh, twofold for me. So I work alone, but I have resource partners. Mm -hmm. that, that's probably the best way to say it. So they they work with me on projects in certain areas: social media, IT, um, video, because I do media as well as um, soft skills. So yeah, but I haven't ha I haven't determined.
time and i think i'm at that crossroads this is interesting i'm at the crossroads where i think i need to hire a dedicated support but it's a toss up what that support needs to look like because i feel like they need to have multiple expertise because i come from the corporate world so my head kind of functions that way but i don't know that i found that yet and i need to make sure that that research is going to help me generate money to do that instead of being a liability so the reason i bring this up is because we as entrepreneurs tend to be self-limiting in our vision of what's possible for our business because of the real practical reality that you brought up your name alicia Lewis. alicia yeah said that i can't afford to pay anybody else is essentially what she said right mm -hmm. so some businesses can't exist without having more than one person <coughs> a media business right are you by yourself you have yeah. you have a team well, there you go, see. So one of the insights that I would like to share with you guys is the reality that you can get a bigger bottom line, a more successful business, and move through growth a lot faster if you open up your mind to the possibility of bringing other experti expertise into your business, short of full-time employees. Okay, You may get to the point where you end up with full-time employees. So this is what you're talking about around specific uh, professional help. But there's also skill-based help, okay? So we do this 12-week program and it, and it becomes obvious to me really quick that everybody is not going to get good at everything, all right? You need to know a lot of different kinds of things in terms of running a business, but there's going to be some things that you're really good at, some things that you're okay at, and some things that you're really bad at, all right? So we are in a world where risk is rampant, you know, you're being an entrepreneur, if, if you wanted to reduce your risk and get paid, what would you do? Reduce your risk and still get paid. Job. You'd have a job, right? Isn't that the sort of definition of a job? That ain't somebody else's problem, right? So I was an entrepreneur. I was, I was an employee of my own company. Now I work for a nonprofit. And at the nonprofit, I'm like, well, these people are sitting around eating lunch and enjoying themselves. I'm like, they got it easy, man. Because, you know, when you work as an employee, there's a lot of stuff taken care of for you. And when you're doing your own business, ain't nobody taking care of nothing, right? You got to take care of everything yourself. So the challenge that we have is to figure out how do we bring expertise into our business expeditiously so that we don't make these huge mistakes, right, in the, in, the, in the startup phase. Risk mistakes. Mistakes around not having insurance. I'm not even going to ask how many people don't have insurance right now because one of the big mistakes that happens is people can start, I can't afford insurance, you know, or not having legal advice available to you when you're signing a lease or negotiating a contract or um, not uh, knowing, not having a good graphic designer so you end up, your website ends up looking sort of like a, you know, hokey pokey mokey there, right? Or having sent, putting out marketing materials that, that are not, uh, that are not uh, as good as your competitors because you haven't brought, because you think you could have done it by yourself. And this is, this is not to criticize anybody who's an entrepreneur. We do this because our, li our resources are so limited. I mean, I'd be, I made my first business card with a rubber stamp on a piece of paper, okay? So I know what it's like to get started at, be at the beginning. But that is an interesting thing where we self-limit by not bringing in expertise and then making sort of the same mistakes over and over again. So how would we, as business people, get the resources to get the help sooner rather than later? I'm going to throw that question out. Think about that. How would you get those resources? The only thing that I thought about um, is I, I was part of an organization called the um, NACW, which is the National Association of Professional Women. They have a lot of different um, you know, webinars and stuff like that. There was one that was speaking on virtual assistance. And that was the one that I was more geared towards because it was more affordable right. and again, won't me, just me. So um, I was looking to see what actually I can have someone else do when it comes to making a product that may be a little bit different, but there's a lot of things that's in the office that, that needs to be done. Right. Like I work from home, so I like never sleep because I always have work around me. Either I have to do paperwork or I have to do this. And I'm working with uh, an accountant and, you know, so to um, do the virtual assistance, I'm really looking into that. 
So that's skills, that's skills. Yes, we would have to identify all those different skill sets. But if we're limited by money, then where are we gonna get more money? Okay, see, where are we going to get more money? I was going to say we could barter, but that's not quite the same as more money. Right. Maybe we can get funding. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, the other thing that I see entrepreneurs doing, I can say this now because having taught the class for so long and meeting a lot of entrepreneurs, um, is there's a high level of resistance to using other people's money. Other people's money. Now, other people's money is a bunch of things. We all start with our own money, right? Yes. Unless, unless it was dad's money, mom's money. Independently wealthy, any? But no. No. no, no not, not today. <laughs> I wish. I dream about it. So there are no businesses that are growing using their own money anymore. And they never were, and they never will be. They're all using other people's money. And for entrepreneurs, I can see you're all like, no way! I'm like, this is a, raises the anxiety level tremendously. I'm not going to use other people's money. Why? Why are people afraid of using other people's money? Um, I think it's the fear <coughs> of having to pay it back. Boom. And in what time frame do you got it? What's the return? You know, what right. are these investors expecting? Right. What are the right. persistent time frame? Right. Can I make that? Exactly. Now, yes? I think the other thing to that is, is that once someone lends you money or gives you money, as an entrepreneur, a lot of us want to make our own decisions. So now are you beholding to them? And so now it's like, when they give you a suggestion, you're thinking, I gotta listen to them now. And um, does what they're saying make sense? And if you don't agree with them, is that gonna be an issue? And, so I think that that's the other part of it is being being you know beholden to them um, to pay them back and also to get their um, input and sometimes it may be an unwanted input. Right. <laughs> but that's where it's just. Mm -hmm. just yeah. That's a real I was going to say, but I want the gentleman back. My younger gentleman. Was, was so. Um, I've had a business for a long time, about 45 years. The concept of using other people's money is, here's how I've done it, is working with my federal credit union. The credit union has different products. So I do a job for a client, and that client pays me $10,000. I do not take that $10,000 and spend it. I take the $10,000 and I deposit it into the credit union and I tell the credit union that I want a $10,000 loan against that 10,000 that I just put in. Now I got 20,000. It is imperative for me now to pay off that 10,000 that I just borrowed from the credit union. So I make the deal with the credit union that I'm going to pay you $1,000 for the next 10 months. After the 10 months, I now have $20,000 in my account. Mm -hmm. I have bad credit, but you know something? I don't worry about credit because I have collateral. Collateral permits me to use other people's money. Mm -hmm. This is the benefit, again, of networking and having a mentor. Someone that has a level of expertise maybe not in the area of your particular business, but in business. You can benefit from that particular individual or individuals. Um, the other part when you're in business is how do you determine your risk versus someone else's risk? Everyone in this room has a different level of risk. The question was asked once, uh, if someone, if you place the $1,000 on the table at night and tomorrow morning only 50% was available, how would you respond? If you placed that same $1,000 at night and tomorrow none of it was there, how would you respond? That's um, a barometer of how you could determine what's your risk level. 
That's why when you're engaging using other person's money, especially family, uh, you want to have a MOU or memorandum of understanding to express to them you are a limited partner. You're not a CFO, you're just a limited partner. You set the rules up front so they understand that they do not have ownership in your business, they just have an equity share in your business. So that's very key when you have a business. Then as your business continues to grow, you may in turn become a mentor to someone else because of the tools and the resources that you've gained over the years of being mentored. So this is interesting because not all other people's money is created equal, right? There's strangers, there's people that we know, there's family members, there's partners. There's like 15 different ways that you could use other people's money. So this is not a class in financing, but sort of a, a psychological journey that we all have to go on of what is our resistance to using other people's money. And that certainly comes up all the time. I totally understand that. I mean, I was in a restaurant business and we, I, I never did it by myself. I, I started with five partners, they ended up with eight partners. The last project I was involved had 23 partners. Okay, but I can confidently go into a meeting because, and not worry about people telling the management team what to do, because we have successfully been able to get a handle on what our financials look like. And we're confident in what's going on in the business today and what we think is gonna go on in the business tomorrow. So for you guys who are developing businesses right now, one of the, the, the levels, the things that are gonna give you a high level of confidence to be able to take in other people's money is to really get a handle on what's happening with your business in terms of its sales and its expenses. This is not a theoretical exercise. This is a practical exercise in business management 101. What are my sales, what are my expenses? If you guys aren't historically keeping track of that over the month to month to month, you really don't have any idea of where your business is going. I'm not saying that as an accusation, I'm just pointing out that how incredible a tool that is. Once you have a handle on what's been happening in the recent past and currently, then you can accurately start taking a look at what can happen going out. So you can make intelligence decisions about bringing in additional resources and not being so anxious about how that money is going to get paid back, right? When you initially start, you're like, how many customers do you have when you start? Like one, zero, maybe none. You're like, whoa, somebody wants me to do this. What am I going to charge them, right? So the reality is, though, every time you go to a month and a month and a month, you've got that behind. You've got that another month, another month, another month. Now, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm not talking in specifics because there's, there's all different kinds of businesses in here. But the reality is that your ability to grow totally based on what your net income is, is going to be hugely limiting. Because what are you using that net income for? You got to pay your bills. You got your rent, you got your food, you got your family, you got everything, right? Right? So there's this vicious cycle of like, oh, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I can take that risk. So it is a self-limiting kind of thing. I just wanted to say, though, that, you know, the dirty little secret out there and Wendy was talking about it earlier, it's not dirty and it isn't really a secret, is the reality is that there's money all over the place in the real estate business, in the insurance business, in the, I know some rich folks who got money that they don't know what to do with. I know some relatively affluent people who wouldn't mind lending me 10,000 bucks because they believe in you, okay, lending you the money. Not buying your business, lending you the money. Lending you the money means, and I'm just speculating, that I'm going to pay you back over time, piece by piece, with the money plus a little extra, right? People who have extra money are doing that all the time. And they're putting it this place and the other place to get 1%, 2%, whatever, you know? So the reality is there, there are different ways you can get money. The other thing is this, is that we are always, we're all borrowing money even now, and we're convincing ourselves that we're not. How many people in this room have a credit card? Most people, right? How many of the people have a, a car loan? Some of you. Some of you might even have a mortgage, right? Some of you may have loans for your kids going to college, you know? The industry of bar, you did that, all right. The industry is out there. So the idea is to bring that inside to your business to realize that 
this, this idea of growth is really contingent on where are the resources coming from, where are the skills resources, where's the financial resources, and it really starts with getting your own financial house organized in a way that you can raise your confidence level. We're talking about money. That's just one dynamic of business. It's none of us can eat unless we have a customer. Unless you're going to be accustomed to, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you're going to be accustomed to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And sometimes it's going to mean that just to be able to get your business to the level of where you want it to go. But let's talk about levels of your business. How do you know how you, your business is growing if you don't have a map? You got to have a business plan. Uh, what I've discovered over the years is a lot of times people confuse a good idea, a dream, with that's how it's going to go. You got to put it on paper because you want, you need a mission statement, something to keep you focused when you get a windfall or when you have an extended drought because depending what type of business you have will determine the peaks, the highs, the lows, the valleys that you're experiencing. How do you weather those storms? You know, when your business encountered it, do you throw in the towel? Again, go back to the, the notion of when the emotion of starting your business has subsided and you still got to do your business, do you still have that drive? What's your passion? What's your drive? And then how do you accumulate more customers? Because remember, they're not clients until they, they're, they're, only, what say, they're only customers until they do repeat business with you and become your clients. So that, you know, just because somebody bought a bar of soap or um, got one pin from you doesn't mean that they're really your client. They just became a customer. So how do I determine who's a customer, who's a client, and who's a time waster? Because you're in business, and you want to make certain you're not chasing rabbits. But you, yeah, yeah. But you really want to make certain that, okay, I value my time. I want everyone that I deal with to va appreciate my time as well. And sometimes you have to make hard decisions and hard statements to people that you love the most. And that means that you really got to know who your customer is and will be in the future. Because the customer that you started with may be not the customer that you grow with. All right? I, had a, I worked with a guy who was a DJ, and he started out with customers that were paying him $50 a gig. And he was, it was rough, and he decided to uh, upscale his business and uh, expand it. He had a team, and he was doing all this kind of extra value stuff for parties. And all of a sudden, he didn't need the $50 customer. So he said, the best thing I did was actually to not have to be at that starting level. So when he moved up to the next level, he said he got more respect. He was able to add value. People were paying him for extras. He was making a lot more money per gig. So we all start at one place, but we, we have to figure out where we're starting and where we're going, you know? You know, it's funny because we talk about this business plan. How many people in this room actually sat down and wrote a business plan? Wrote it. Put your hand in here if you wrote a business plan. All right. You're working on it. All right. So I'm going to tell you right now, you are right. People who are entrepreneurs are writing a business plan in their head all the time, okay? The reality is, though, that it's important to put down the decisions about your business on paper. Not some fancy, th now if you're gonna go out and get a loan for $100,000, you may have to put this fancy thing with a cover and all that kind of stuff, you know. I had to write a business plan for the last business project and we had to raise a million bucks and I had to put a cover on it, put pictures in it, you know, all that kind of stuff. But your business plan is always in your head. So the reality is you should really at the beginning and a a a every so often, really go back to that and sort of write, who, what am I selling? Who am I selling to? Who's my competitors? What does the general market look like? How am I doing my marketing? What are my marketing choices? What's my pricing? What are my operating expenses? What are my fixed costs? What is my sales projection? My sales projection. How many of you got sales projections? Casey's got sales projections. But you're not able to plan, and I know I'm speaking like, oh, I'm like saying, I'm calling you out in school here. But I guess part of, part of our job today is sort of point out best practices, you know? Knowing what you think you're going to do 12 months ahead 
is the best way to get a sense of how much effort you're going to need to put into doing that. And it's no better way to get confidence in your business than to what? Exceed your expectations. Right? There's no, yes? So I have a question. So the thoughts that you have about your business as you write those down, because I'm very proficient at doing that yeah. versus doing some big plan. But those thoughts are breadcrumbs to the plan. Is that? That is the plan. Yeah. Let's not okay. get crazy. Right. You know, it's really funny. Yeah, People are, yeah. so I just want to break true. this down. I'm trying to keep it simple, you know? Your business plan is basically what am I going to do, with whom, at what time, to do what, at what price, where, with whom, and the result will be what? This amount of sales, it'll cost this much, I need this much to get started. It really helps you lower the anxiety around what the priorities are. Because if you think that through, and spend a little time on that, you'd be like, oh, now I have to do this. Now I have to do that. How come I never have any money? Well, I get people to start a business and I go, they keep running out of money. How much money did you have to start? A uh, hundred bucks. What? Right? So there's the reality of we don't always take the time to acknowledge the steps that are required to be successful. So if we start with too little money, we're always behind the eight ball, right? If we don't have enough vision about who our customers are going to be, we're always chasing the rabbits. Is that what you said? So I think, too, um, working in this environment um, where there are so many different small businesses of different sizes and different types and everybody's at a different level, um, I wanted to ask specifically, um, in, in the case of Rise of High Capital, right, we have a community group. Do you find it beneficial to put folks in a collective environment that are at different levels of their business? I would assume that's sort of a yeah. model, right, where they all kind of learn from each other. How does that, you know, how does that impact? Because in trying to figure out some programming and things to do here for our small businesses, I'm like, well, everybody's on a different level. But then there's beauty, right, because somebody that's here might be able to offer something to somebody that's, you know, down here that is just getting started. So a roundabout way to ask my question, which is, um, essentially, when someone is starting a business, I think what's the, and I know we talk, we're talking right now about the business plan, but what's the, what's the first sort of key thing that a small business entrepreneur needs to know going into their venture. So, you want to try that? You want to try that? Sure. <laughs> so a lot of people forget to consider the why of what it is that they're starting. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are so excited about what we're doing. We're making the world's best quesadillas, or we got an app that, like, puts <coughs> your phone spinning. <coughs> Whatever. It rains on my phone. It feels like water. Isn't that amazing? that we forget that there are people who have to decide that what we have to offer matters to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we forget that maybe they don't need it, don't want it, or certainly don't desire it. Mm -hmm. right? Or maybe it's not solving anybody's problem whatsoever. It's probably never happened. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, at the end of the day, is may bringing the product or service to test in the marketplace before we get all crazy and get other people's money, spend a lot of money, you know what I mean? And do not ask your brother or your mother or your sister. Can they go to question? They're gonna, well, either they're gonna, they're gonna not support you or they're gonna support you, but that's not what we're talking about, right? So huge companies who are really good at selling stuff will spend a lot of time figuring out whether or not the next Peanut butter and chocolate Cheerios is actually going to be a good thing on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And the peanut butter and chocolate Cheerios. I don't like that. Touchdown, Captain Crunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is probably the most important thing. You get people, they run off, spend 
you know, they make a patent or they get IP all wrapped up, they get a logo, and they get this, that, and the other thing, and boom, it's like, nobody wants it. In the, yes, please. Uh, well, I was going to say just about the business plan in general is such a wonderful tool. It has so many different components that forces you to think about your business that maybe you wouldn't have thought about it if you hadn't decided to implement a tool. And I said this recently, I, I was in a workshop or something. I, um, my background is in massage and massage education, and I worked for a school that was very grassroots years, of, you know, some years ago. And it did really, really well. And then all the technical training schools got on board with teaching massage therapy courses. So all these big, you know, Lincoln Tech and Chubbs that can afford $25,000 ads in the Sunday paper saying they have a new massage therapy program. Well, that shut down the small, you know, privately owned grassroots massage therapy schools because they couldn't compete with that. And one of the things that the owner didn't count on was somebody coming in and disrupting the business. Um, there was no plan, there was no, there was no growth, there was none of that happening. And then the industry itself changed. <clears throat> and I think with a business, uh, business plan and revisiting that on a regular basis, you can look at, okay, what's my competition now? How am I marketing? You know, um, it was word of mouth before, but that just didn't work. You know, it just didn't work. And now with social media, that's a whole other aspect, you know, to, of it too. And I think that when you look at it over and over again, you look at your business plan, it forces you to reassess things on a regular basis. You may not need to make changes, or maybe you do need to make changes, but it forces you to do that if you're committed to, to following the process. And let's not, let's not, some people suffer from, now I'm just speaking, this is just based on my own experience with the students that I'm working with, suffer from writing anxiety and it sounds like a term paper. No, it sounds like I'm going to school and it sounds like, <laughs> sounds like I'm already getting dizzy. I need to make myself a cup of tea, so. This is just about coming up with a plan for your business. That's a series of decisions about how you're gonna go forward. So if you think of it like that, and Andrew's not in the room, but I'm sure he can push out to everybody who came today, a simple outline of what questions you need to answer for yourself, okay? You could have a two-page summary of the plan for your business. If you were going to raise a million bucks, you might have to add a couple of extra things in there, but um, let's not get crazy about this. This is really about being intentional about what we're, we're doing and really being thorough about doing our homework about how this is all gonna work and not, uh, in, not getting involved in magical thinking. Anybody know what magical thinking is? Does anybody in this room know magic? You know what's magical thinking? Yeah, thinking that uh, you have the answers without the proper uh, evaluation of what it, what it is to make it happen. That's part of it. What else is magical thinking? I'll just build this thing and they'll come. That's right. If you build it, they will come. Like, just feel the dreams. Yeah. Yeah. The other magical thinking is this business is going to cost me $30,000. I only have fifteen, so I'm just going to make it happen with $15,000. <laughs> And what actually is going to happen, you're always going to be $15,000 behind. So I say that because there are some realities to business, and it has to do with being honest about what the scale is, what the help you need is, what resource, and how long it's going to take. Because if you are, if you are not honest and realistic with the, with the resources and the time, then your plan is going to stretch out. You know, Wendy was talking about missing uh, projections for investors, all right? But who is your first investor in your business? Yourself, right? This is your time, money, and life, right? So if you can't be honest with yourself, it's gonna to be tough going forward. Also, to your point about where you're taking someone that say they have a business, with the business plan, it will help them determine, do I have just a hobby or do I have a legitimate business? Because sometimes, we think it's what we do building cars, that could be a nice hobby. All of a sudden, some, I wanna buy that car. Whoa, all right, I wanna buy that car. So that's two people that express interest in wanting to buy your cars, but that's it. So they just only saw the end product of your hobby, but they didn't realize 
or maybe you didn't realize or it will help you determine whether or not can I continue doing this and become the next Model T or you know whatever Chrysler 300 because a young lady brought up earlier about disruption. Is what your business going to do, is it a disruption to what is already existent? Like Netflix came to Blockbuster with a disruptive idea, Blockbuster, because they were stuck in the era, they were good in their era, they loved the people coming in, pacing because they had to get it in by a certain time, but yet they reneged, or they didn't renege, they rejected a Netflix idea, and today there's no more Blockbuster, but there is Netflix. The same thing goes with the transportation industry. That's, that's a change, and even with the hotels, there's still a change. I don't know about this Airbnb stuff, but anyway. But again, is what you're doing, is it something that's going to enhance what's already in existence? Again, you have to do your research. Find out who's doing what you're doing because while you're on the East Coast, there's somebody on the West Coast probably thinking the same thing. So is, are there patents out there? You know, am I the only one that has this idea? The, there's a lot of variables. Even if a business had been in existence for a number of years, there's still some of these same questions, to your point, the same questions you need to ask yourself that you asked in the beginning, you need to ask it in the middle, and you need to ask it in the end. My question is, what do my customers want today? What do they want tomorrow? And what might they, they want in a, a year or two years from now? You know, being in a restaurant business in New York City, it's like being in the fashion business. It like changes every six months. You know, it's hysterical. It's like crazy. One of the reasons why I ended up being involved in a number of different projects is because you're always putting the next one out, the next one out, the next one out, because people will just chase that dream all the time. New York City is a really twisted market like that because there's always people chasing the, the dream about that. But um, you are got to be a constant learner. You have to, your passion is not only invested in managing your business and working with your customers, but, but being invested in, in the area, the area that you've become an expert in, right? You need to know what's happening today and tomorrow and the next day, you know? It's, and I know that sounds like a lot of work. That's why, that's why, you know, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart, right? Like, it's really more about uh, uh, a mission. You know, you talk about the mission, like, you really do have to ask yourself, what is it I would do? And this is, sounds crazy, but even if I didn't get paid. Because the reality is of being an entrepreneur is that you just might not get paid for a while, and you still have to keep doing it, right? We were informed we have about four minutes remaining, so we want to kind of put this out there to you so you can have it. Yes, sir. Um, um, And with that, what I started to do with clients is to say to them, um, don't go looking for a template online. Here's what I want you to do. I'd like for you to get 22 separate sheets of paper. And on the telephone, I would just say to them, okay, so, so the first page, let's just call that executive summary. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the history of your company? What about your motto? What about your, um, do you have a mission statement? Where are you going to put this business? And I would have the people write this information down as I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. And on each piece of paper, I would give them a title to put. So that at the end of a 15, 20 minute uh, conversation, I would say, now I want you to elaborate on each of those issues, and there's your business plan. Mm -hmm. awesome. yeah. And the, the Community Business Academy, which is the 12-week the training program I was talking about, actually walks you through all those things. And we break it up into a little bit homework seg section so that when you are done, you actually have your uh, basic business plan worked out. So there are a lot of different ways to approach it. That's the way I wrote the business plan for my last restaurant because to approach it as a huge project is just it just never gets done well I think something you said earlier is that your business plan really is in your head yeah. we got to get it out of your head yeah. and all yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.
I'm realizing now as I'm developing my business that the business is a live, the business plan is a living, breathing thing. If I don't look at it as a document, if I look at it as something that has to stay stagnant. Um, I'm able to to put it into perspective as like raising a child. Like, okay, my baby is here at this point. I wanted to know this, 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 and this. I wanted to be exposed to this, 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 and this, and I wanted to to be in this environment. And then as it grows older. Where, where will I transition so that it can grow? Where will I transition? So I have to look at it more as, um, like I said, a living, breathing thing. Um, what I learned in writing my business plan is that I have to be present. Like um, a lot of people are, are ready to shoot for the moon, and I want to, I want to end up here, but I, I had to ground myself and be present in where I am right now, and say, okay, this is my reality. This is what I see. And even though I want to end up here, I have to really open my eyes and live and breathe in this moment about the business and then that makes writing my business plan even easier because I'm able to see right now. So, so we have to leverage business credit. So I establish business entities for them and then we work on building their business credit as a, as a whole. That's my so they can go and use other people's money? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what said. I was like, yeah, that's good. Good place to end, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you. Thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you shared a lot of wisdom. I was here for some of it, but not all of it, but. Great.